Good afternoon, everyone, uh, I welcome you to the first afternoon session on behavioral economics. And the first speaker is Ryan Murphy from BTA. All right, good, thank you for the introduction. My, again, my name is Ryan Murphy. I'm the Chair of Decision Theory and Behavioral Game Theory here at the ETH in Zurich. I'm gonna be presenting some rather new research. So this is something we've only started in the last two, two months or so. Um, this is work that's done in conjunction with Robert Tenbrink, who's sitting back there, and he'll take the more difficult questions. Uh, feel free when I'm giving the talk at any time to interrupt or ask questions. I think it'll be more interesting if this is a discussion rather than me just talking at you for the full half hour. So let me start off with this quote. I came across this a couple weeks ago in Bloomberg News, and this is from the EU's financial services chief, talking about bank investors should have the maximum ratios set on the size of their bonuses, compared with their fixed pay, he's recommending. And this, this recommendation has in it this, this idea that bonuses that are large multiples of fixed pay are, quote, likely to encourage excessive risk taking, and thus undermine the confidence in financial sector generally. So according to these plans. So I look at this and I see several things. First of all, I have the same intuition. And I see in this quote there's, there's at least three things going on. There's risk, there's incentives, and there's strategic interactions. And these things are very interesting to me. I'm not a bank regulator at all, but these things are close to my heart. So from the academic standpoint, when we look at this kind of problem, we can see that there's decision theory and then there's game theory. And there's typically a hard line that divides these two academic silos. So decision theory is concerned when there's one decision maker making choices, and typically this is where we talk about risk in decision making. And then game theory are those situations in which there's more than one decision maker, strategic interactions. So part of my intention today is to develop a problem that is a risky decision problem developed in the domain of decision theory, and then extend that, use that as part of a framework into game theory, and start to see if we can study both risk at the same time as strategic decision making. All right? Okay. So starting off, decision theory. Decision theory is concerned. It has this demarcation between certainty, risk, and uncertainty, and a lot of attention is dedicated in this area of risk. And by this, we mean that there's some single monolithic decision maker who's presented with risky prospects. And these things are well-defined. So it's a well-defined option set. Here's what the options are. Well-defined probabilities. Here's what the probabilities are given these choices. And the payoffs are very clear for each of these things. And so typically, very simple gambles like this are used to measure people's preferences for risk. So let me show you one of these things. So this is an example of a static, risky decision problem. And these things form the basis of a lot of what we do in decision theory. They're so common that they are referred to sometimes as the fruit flies of decision research. So we present a decision maker with these two options. Option A, you have a sure gain of 240. Or option B, you have a 25% chance to gain 1,000 or 75% chance to gain nothing. So which of these things do you prefer? And as it turns out, expected value maximization doesn't seem to be a good indicator or predictor of what people are going to do. And even in a really simple problem like this, you find that about 85% of people choose option A, even though its expected value is lower. And so we start to see these behavioral tendencies. That, and this is evidence of risk aversion, which is a valuable construct in understanding how people face risky choices. Okay? So these are commonly used in decision theory, but I need to use something a little more complicated to motivate this problem. So that's a static problem. Let me show you a dynamic problem. So imagine that there's an urn. For your reference, that's how I would draw an urn. Okay? So there's this urn, and it has balls in it. And they're fully shuffled. 90% of them are good. 10% are bad. Good draws are worth one, and if there's a bad draw, then that results in bankruptcy and termination of the task. Draws are made with replacement. I'm doing that so that the probabilities stay the same, constant throughout this whole process. So the decision maker in this risky task is called upon to make choice, to select out of this urn one at a time. The choice the decision maker is faced with is how long to keep making draws, how long to start to accumulate these earnings, and when to stop and walk away. They can walk away and keep their earnings, but they run the risk of going bankrupt every time they take an additional draw. Is this clear? OK. So this is an example of a dynamic, risky decision task. There are some others that exist in the literature, but they're not all that prevalent. So there's this, this old paper by Paul Slovic, and he had this thing called the devil's task. And so the decision makers in this study were children, and the tokens weren't money, they were chocolate. And the decision makers in this task had to choose how much chocolate they could try and accumulate while risking how much more they, they could lose. All right? 
And so this study has been, it's been extended a little bit looking at behavior and finding out that the kids who keep going for more and more and more chocolate, they're the ones that you gotta have, keep your eye on. As it turns out, those are kids that are more likely to get injured in accidents or traffic accidents later. So it has some predictive capacity, but it's not well known as a paper and largely forgotten. These next two are rather well known in the area of decision making, but each of them has a substantial limitation in that the underlying probabilities are not given to the decision maker when they're presented with this task. The decision maker doesn't know what the risk is as they're choosing between these different options. The Iowa card task presents people with different cards that have values on them face down, and they draw from the different decks. The different decks have different properties, sometimes with higher payoffs, but sometimes with higher variance. So decision makers in this environment are doing two things at the same time. They're learning, they're learning about the probabilities of gain and loss in each of these different decks as they're sampling from them, and they're also trying to, we think in some way, maximize their payoff, get as much money as possible. So if a decision maker makes a choice, it's hard to make attributions as to why they're doing this. They could be risk seeking or they could be information seeking. And this undermines the usefulness of these kinds of tasks. This has been recognized by researchers recently that there are these limitations and there's this card task called the Columbia card task that was developed by Figner and others in which cards are shuffled and spread out. There are good cards and bad cards and the decision maker is paid every time they get a good card. One of the problems with this task that undermines it is that it's done without replacement. And so there's two things that are changing for the decision makers. They're making these risky choices. One is their wealth level because they're accumulating earnings, but also is the probability of running into a bad card. Okay? So what we would like to do is find a task that's well-defined, is dynamic in this multi-stage sense, has well-defined payoffs and probabilities associated with risk, and maintains a constant risk level all the way through. So the task that I showed you initially, this sequential draw task with this urn, meets this criteria. And this is what I want to use to motivate the rest of this discussion, okay? So within this task, there's this urn that's shuffled, the decision maker is presented with it, draws are worth one. Bad draws result in bankruptcy, so all the accumulated earnings disappear, the task is over and they get zero. Draws are made with replacement and the probabilities are well-defined and stable. So do I have a victor or a volunteer? Who'd like to try this? What would you do? Before I start to pick on someone, what would you do in this task? So one thing we can do is we can program this. It's part of an experiment. This is something we've programmed now to run and give actually people a chance to do this. It works on a computer, any computer on the internet. It works on an iPad if you want to do portable research. So is there anyone here who wants to do this? And I'll pay real money. You want to do it? All right, so what would you do? Nope. So you would draw, I presume, yes? Okay. <laughs> Not. <laughs> uh, let's try this again. Maybe you'll, be, maybe you'll do better this time, all right? Okay, so now you have one. So you're facing one, for sure, chance to draw more. What do you want to do? Okay. You want to keep drawing? I don't know why you think you have to get to 10 francs. But. Oh, did you? <laughs> Got it, okay. You'd stop there, really? You don't want to draw anymore? All right, so this is an example of this task. And this is something that is, is easy to explain to people. They get it quickly, they can do this. I'll pay you your three francs in a moment, okay? Um, and for those of you who are interested in trying it, it's posted here on a website. Anyone can use it as a, try it out, use it as a research tool. So a natural question that arises when we present these kind of dynamic risky choices to people is what should you do? What's the optimal thing to do? So what's the normative solution to this task? Well, the way to think about that is for each stage, the decision maker is choosing between two things, a sure payoff of their current holdings they've accumulated, which is H, versus this risky option that can marginally increase their holdings by V and does so with probability P, okay? And so you can set this up and just with a little bit of algebra work out what the optimal solution is. So in this context, the decision maker should continue to make draws as long as the expectation of making those draws is greater than their current holdings. And when the probability in this case is 0.9, that means that you should be willing to draw nine times. 
If a person decides to stop sooner, that would be evidence of risk aversion. A person doesn't want to take risk. Drawing more than that would be evidence of risk seeking. And we can vary the probabilities of gain on this. And so these are the optimal thresholds. If the probability of gain is 0.9, we expect the optimal is 9. If we tune the probability of gain up to 0.95, the person should be willing to take 19 draws. Okay. The expected value is reasonably straightforward to compute on this. So this is the expected value of different policies, how many times you drew. So if you decide to draw only three, it gives you much lower expectation. And this curve is maximized by taking nine. If a person has different risk attitudes, this shifts in a very a predictable way. Also, this thing shifts in very predictable ways as we tune the probabilities. As the probability of gain increases, the mass of this thing shifts to the right. Okay. So, so this really is just the bars with no probabilities. So why, yeah. why, not, why not just do as bars and you tell them, you know, show me if the balloon gets bigger and just say, well, next time there's a 10% chance the balloon's going to pop. So the, the question had to do with there's this decision task called the BART, the balloon analog risk task. And yes, this is, this is highly analogous to it. So in terms of visual representation, this strikes me as more straightforward than the volume of air. So it's just a different oh, I, I would actually disagree with that. Would you? Because I'm pretty familiar with it. You know, people, almost everybody has experience blowing up a balloon or seeing a balloon blown up. And as opposed to an abstract urn. Yeah, I could, I could see that argument. So, so my objection with the BART isn't it's the representation. It's that the decision makers have no idea what the underlying probabilities are. So right, OK. You could do that too. Yep. Okay. So, and we can think of that this this sequential draw task as that. Okay. So, so far, what I've been talking about is in the context of decision theory, just a risky, dynamic decision problem. And what I'm interested to do is now to extend this into a game theoretic situation. Okay. So, I hopefully everyone is clear on what this decision task is. Now, let's imagine the next situation, the following situation. So, imagine that we have two players. So, one player has an urn. Again, the same setup, and is making draws from the certain probability of, of a good outcome is 0.9. There's another player doing the exact same thing. They have their own urn, and they're drawing from it with replacement. So the players are making their draws sequentially, and they're doing so privately. They can't see what the other one is doing. The player with the most points at the end, the most accumulated H, wins the game, and they get some positive payoff. Let's just call it payoff one. The person who doesn't win, who has the fewer points, earns nothing. If there happens to be a tie, if they both happen to reach the same point and decide to walk away, then a coin is flipped just to break that tie. Or if they both go bankrupt, again. So we just break ties by some random device. And all of this information is commonly known. Okay. So this isn't just a risky decision task anymore. Now it's a game because there's at least two players and they're competing against each other. This turns out to be a constant sum game. I'm putting the game in a context of a winner take all. That's it. That's true. And I'll get to a case that involves that. But for now, what I'm doing is a binary payoff that the winner takes all, the loser gets nothing. Yeah, but it's important to note that that's, that's the nature of this payoff structure of this game. All right? So, what's the normative solution? What's the rational thing to do here? And it starts to get complicated rather quickly. So expected value maximization doesn't do a lot of help. Remember before, the expected value max policy is to draw a 9, and that's it. Always draw a 9. But if I'm playing against someone who's always going to draw a 9, I can beat them. I can beat them 58% of the time by drawing just 1. Okay? But if someone is smart, they realize that I would realize that. And then they wouldn't draw 9 anymore. They would know I'm going to draw 1, and they would best respond to that. So they'd draw 2. Player two realizes this, player one realizes this, and so on and so on. And so there's this escalation that goes from there. So the way to try and figure this out is set up a payoff matrix. And that's what this is. I know that's a lot of numbers, but here's the case where one player goes for nine and the other player goes for nine. The expectation there for player one is to win half the time. That's not an equilibrium because the player has an incentive to do something different, to play one. So you start to look through this matrix, starting to see if this thing settles down somewhere. It doesn't. So there's not a fixed point. This process of best response to best response would continue to cycle through these different payoffs. So what that means is that we don't have a 
pure strategy equilibrium in here. So we have to go look for a mixed strategy. So one thing that it turns out, which is very nice for this class of problems, is that strategy 12 or anything greater than that is canceled out. It's strictly dominated by some combination of strategies 1 through 11. So we can reduce the complexity of this matrix substantially. So then we're just left with an 11 by 11 matrix. And then we can try and solve this game. Okay. So it turns out. You would not, but your opponent would. Your opponent would then best respond to a seven. Or further up, eight. It, this is a constant sum version. And so player one's trying to maximize, player two's trying to minimize. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I should have been clear about that. Okay. I see, I see. okay. So if you reduce this, if you try and reduce this payoff matrix down to the mixed strategy equilibrium, it turns out that there is one mixed strategy equilibrium for this game. And it has this form. So this was a surprise. So players shouldn't, of course, zero is strictly dominated. You should always at least try and draw something. They should never go for three. Okay. The mass of this, of this vector is mostly concentrated on 10. And then the next most common strategy people should use is go for eight, the next most common is six, and so on. So this is one way to visualize it, this is another way. This was very surprising to me. This was not what I expected by developing this simple stochastic game that has this very strangely shaped mixed strategy equilibrium. But it's been verified. Several different methods have been used and converge on this as the mixed strategy equilibrium. Okay. So again, to be clear on this, this is the optimal response for the players in this stochastic game. Sometimes they should be trying to draw 10, sometimes they should be trying to draw 4, and they should be aiming for those targets with these probabilities. So one natural next question would be how this varies in terms of P. So this is the probability of gain from these urns is 0.9. What happens is you start to move P around a little bit. So this, as it turns out, is the mixed strategy equilibrium if the probability of gain is 0.8. So this would mean that the players wouldn't want to take so many draws, and that makes sense, but it shifts the mass back here to closer to one. Again, it has this form. One, let me show you next here is a movie that shows all of the mixed strategy equilibriums as we sweep across P values from P of 0.8 up to 0.95. And there's several different things that start to emerge out of this. A lot of the transitions between the probabilities are smooth, but then there are these jumps. There are these big discontinuities that are occurring. And so then you get up to 0.95. And again, it's a unique mixed strategy that has that general shape. These discontinuities follow a pattern which is kind of surprising. This was really surprising to me. So what this plot shows is how the probability of win, just like the movie I showed you, and these spikes occur when the probability mass changes a lot. So the y-axis is the, uh, the delta between two adjacent equilibria solution, and just take the absolute value of that and sum it up. And so if there's a huge shift in what the optimal policy is, what the optimal uh, best response is, then you get this big spike and you get this, this kind of picture that comes out of it. It looks almost fractal. This, again, surprising. We've only seen this in the last couple of weeks. I'd love to hear input and feedback on about the nature of what's going on here. OK, so this is the constant sum version of the game. Let me show you now, building on the question you asked, is what if we change the payoff structure here a little bit? So no longer that it's a constant sum or a zero sum game, rather that there's two sources of values that the decision makers have in this context. So some of their earnings can come from their own stochastic play, the draws that they're making, and some of their earnings come from being the relative winner, beating the other guy. So again, the exact same setup I showed you before, you have two players here, two independent earns, probability of gain in each one is 0.9. And these players are making these draws sequentially and independently and privately. So in this particular task, the decision makers can keep their earnings. 
and the player with the most earnings gets a bonus. And in this case, for this example, the bonus I'll have just equal to one. The loser earns no bonus. Ties are also randomly broken, just as before, just like flipping a coin. And again, all this information is perfectly common knowledge. Okay. Questions about this before I go on? What do you think is going to happen? No predictions. Okay, so in this context, the decision makers are trying to get these payoffs from two different sources. To maximize payoffs, one thing decision makers could do, I would say intuitively, we know that in the individual case, drawing nine maximizes expected value in the narrow sense. So imagine we make a gentleman's agreement. Dan and I make a gentleman's agreement with each other. You draw nine, I'll draw nine, that'll be fine. We'll both maximize our relative payoffs, that's great. And if we happen, one's a winner, he gets the bonus, that's nice. Do you think that's stable? Think like a game theoretician. If I know he's gonna play nine, what should I do? Again, I can give myself an edge. I can beat him about eight, eight to 10% of the time by playing 10, one more than that. And so in this context where there's this dual payoff, this is the mixed strategy equilibrium. There is no pure strategy equilibrium. And this is the unique mixed strategy that emerges. So players should be drawing, aiming for nine about 4% of the time. They should be aiming for 10 about 17, 18% of the time, and the rest of the time going for 11. But notice what's going on here. It's shifted the mass away from nine. This is, in a way, excessive risk taking. This is drawing more often than you should, and this actually lowers the expected value in the context of getting payoffs from the stochastic process. All right? As it turns out, this stochastic game defined here that has payoffs from both the returns on risk and this bonus that's given is a social dilemma. And this is social dilemma, many of you know, is an instance in which individual rationality leads to a collective demise. And in this game, what we see is that the bonus induces both of the players to take larger risks than are optimal than in the non-strategic case. And as the bonus increases, this problem doesn't get better. As the bonus increases, the collective efficiency decreases, and the players are induced to play more and more varied strategies. And so let's say I tune the bonus up. The bonus I just showed you before is one. Let's say I tune the bonus up to 10. So again, a lot of the mass is above where we would expect, but there's also a lot more variability of how players are making their moves in this game. So again, to point out, this bonus increases, the collective efficiency decreases. The equilibrium strategy here sacrifices about 7.3% of potential earnings. And that, that certainly is missing some, but if you imagine this in a repeated context, if you imagine this with cumulative earnings, giving up 7% returns over a substantial period of iterated play is going to really cut into total level of earnings. So what we see in this context, this from a theoretical sense, offering a bonus to rational players requires spending more money exogenously as the experimenter we do. And doing so induces the players to take non-optimal risks. And they play more varied strategies and ultimately they make less money for doing so. So what I've, just to recap, what I've shown here are these three different contexts. This first example I showed starts in decision theory where there's the situation with one decision maker, they're getting value from draws, there is no competition, so there's no bonus. This is really straightforward to solve, it's a clear optimal policy. So then what I do is I take that same context, that's decision problem, and put it in the context of a game. Now this is a stochastic game. And this one is a winner take all situation, the second situation, only trying to have the most points. And then this third example I showed brings these two things together. So this is a stochastic game in which people are trying to beat the other player, but at the same time maximize their return from their stochastic earnings. And what we find is that this turns out to be a, a social dilemma. And the severity of the social dilemma increases as the size of the bonuses increase. As the bonus gets bigger, it gets worse and worse for the players. All right. So again, the motivation for this talk was thinking about these different academic areas and the research that we do within them, thinking about risk and decision making. And this is the purview of decision theory. 
and also thinking about strategic interactions. And real world problems bring these two things together. So that quote that came at the very beginning, I mean, this is clearly a strong motivation to try and figure out how we can build you know, using these things, these, these tools we have, and make them work in the real world. So that's part of what this research motivation is about. In terms of the question that was raised, uh, in terms of interdisciplinary economics, this is the question that was given to speakers to address. I think the answer is yes. For me, this project required computational methods, heavy computational methods and computing power. Without it, none of this would be possible. So by having this computational power, we can start to take on problems that are just not even tractable with paper and pencil. And that opens up whole new areas in which we can try to solve different games and think about risky choice within strategic contexts. Also, um, the behavior on cognitive considerations, I think, are very important to bring to economics. And what we find in this is that there are these equilibria that are very elegant. They're very delicate, as it turns out. And it's hard to imagine real humans being sensitive to probability changes of 1 over 10,000, and that that has a big effect on how they play these games. And so that's part of the reason to do experiments is because people address these problems not with the sort of crispness that the computer simulations do, but in a bit more fuzzy fashion. And it'd be interesting to see how people are able to mediate that in a strategic setting and what sort of policies do emerge from that. Uh, also, doing this kind of work can help us better un anticipate unexpected consequences. So if you have a particular incentive structure that you're giving to people hoping to induce them to do particular things, it may actually backfire. And having these kinds of methods and being able to work through in a very systematic way can give us some insight into when that would happen. And the punchline of this is that bonuses in this context can induce rational but inefficient behavior. Okay. That's what I wanted to talk to you about today. I invite questions or comments, please. Thank you very much, Brian. There's time for questions or comments. Please, all uh, The question in my head, the comments. The question is what, what is the equilibrium? Is it not pay a bonus? So the, if you do not. Uh, and and that is related to it, but it seems to me it's related to, to the travel as the land where, I mean, which is basically also creating a social dilemma with the help of paying bonuses for right. undercutting. Uh, the other, sure. and it seems to be that you know the, the dynamics in this game is very similar. So the question was, if what would the equilibrium be if there was no bonus at all? Players only got what they earned. That right there. What it turns into is just an individual decision problem. So you're just trying to do, you have your own earning, you're trying to maximize return on that, and I would do my own thing, and we'd be indifferent to what happens to the other. It would be efficient. Also. It would be efficient. Yes, it doesn't have a social dilemma. But I think would be interesting, and the experiment that certainly is, is suggested there is what do real people do in that context? So let's say I find out what you do. It has no effect on my earnings, but I find out that you got 12. Huh, right? So that information may induce people to start to take much larger risks in itself. So the, we, these experiments could be done with just looking at social information, which doesn't change the normative properties. Do you have any preliminary results on what humans actually do? Uh, no. Do I preliminary? No, I don't have any evidence yet. So we're setting up the experiments now. We've pilot tested it. Subjects understand it, but it's not enough data to draw any conclusions. Dan? Um, so uh, do you have, uh, I guess this, this is all done simultaneously, right? All these equilibrium yes. relations for these. So if it's sequential, then things will look quite different. Yes. And especially if the person who's moving second knows what happened to the person who moved first. Yes, it'd be a very different kind of game. And, uh, so that's, that's sort of one, but I think often in financial com contests, mm -hmm. they do have sort of sequential moves, where people do bid sequentially or they sort of take positions sequentially, so that might be an area to explore. The problems, we, we thought about that a little bit, but those problems reduce rather quickly. So if, imagine that we're playing this sequentially and you go first, and you make it to seven and you decide to stop. It's really, it's obvious what I have to do if I want the bonus. Right. I, I have to go for age. The there is, of course, the first person is going to be, that's where the yeah. life will take the second person is. Yep. Uh, yeah. The, the other um, issue is that the question of bonuses and promoting risky behavior, of course, that can be done in a very simple way just by telling people we're going to give you a large bonus if you get to 12. Mm -hmm. and so then it can be rational, but in some sense mm -hmm. increase the likelihood of failure um, for them to try to yep. push all the way to 12. So that, that sort of point we made, I think, relatively in this relatively straightforward way. But what's happening there is that the money is coming from the outside. Correct. That's also what's happening in your game. You're providing yep. this bonus. It's exogenous. Exogenous. Yep. Sort of, 
And that's different than financial markets where actually the money, it's sort of, it's sort of emergent, right? There's a, financial markets, the money's not exogenous. The money is sort of part of the process of the activities that are being undertaken. Mm -hmm. Which is sort of not, not what's going on here. I think what you mean is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very nice first step. Mm -hmm. But there is a big gap between how financial markets I agree. I, I'm very careful about and humble about that I don't have a model of financial markets. I mean, for me, what this is is an exercise of starting with the elemental pieces as I could, as basic as possible, to see if I could build up to this and to discover that this particular context is a social dilemma. I think is is somewhat interesting. Um, but your your notions about where the bonus comes from, those are well taken. That's not the case. Let's thank the speaker again.